the purpose of today's workshop is to pass along as many pro tips as possible. I've been working now for 16 years in the precious metal space as a precious metals dealer. And what I wanted to uh, get across to you today was really as much of my knowledge as possible when it comes to buying and selling precious metals. I want you to be able to maximize uh, the benefit of those purchases and transactions. And in the words of my mentor, get the most ounces for your dollar. So without further ado, my name is Mark Yaxley. I'm the Managing Director of Strategic Wealth Preservation, SWP, which is a fully integrated precious metals dealer and secure storage provider headquartered in the Cayman Islands. We offer uh, precious metals for home delivery within the United States and we also offer our clients access to eight vaults worldwide where they can store precious metals with SWP and also buy and sell precious metals with SWP. But really my point today is education. So I'm going to switch now into uh, presenter mode and uh, run through my presentation as if I was there with you. Enjoy. Okay, so like I said, the purpose of uh, today's workshop is uh, to pass along pro tips about buying and selling physical precious metals. The first thing that we need to cover are a couple of basics. Uh, I'm assuming that there are people in the room that have been buying physical precious metals for many, many years, and there are probably a few others in the room that are, are fairly new to this. So bear with me for those of you who are very experienced. Uh, this is a little bit of a, re a review at the beginning, just to get everybody on the same page uh, so that we all have a common understanding as I move through the presentation. The first thing that I want everybody to understand is what they're looking at in terms of the price, because I'm going to talk about price a few times during this workshop. There are a few things when you see the uh, price of gold, silver, in this case, platinum or palladium that you need to understand. First of all, what you're seeing on this ticker here is what we refer to as the spot price. The spot price of uh, gold or silver refers to the current uh, globally accepted value of one pure ounce of gold or silver. And that's why I included uh, here on the slide a one ounce silver coin and a one ounce gold coin. When we refer to the spot price, which you see here that I, I captured a few days ago on September 20th, the spot price of gold is one ounce of pure gold. It is not actually a one ounce coin. That's going to cost you a little bit more. And we'll get back to that in a few minutes. But it is, I wanted to demonstrate the quantity of gold that we're talking about when we talk about the spot price of gold. And the same applies for silver. We're referring to one ounce of pure silver when we talk about the spot price. You also need to understand the bid and the ask. So the ask price of any commodity is used when a dealer or a broker is selling the product to you, or in your case, as an investor, you're buying it, you're going to base that off of the ask price. And when it comes time for the dealer to buy your product back or the broker to buy your product back, they're going to be referring to the bid price. And you'll notice there's a small, a small spread between the ask and the bid. And that's very common uh, when, when you're looking at commodities, when you're trading commodities. Another quick just reference, so everybody's on the same page here. That is a one ounce gold coin that I am holding in my hands in that picture. So again, just to give you kind of a visual reference of how much gold we are talking about when we talk about the spot price for one uh, for, for gold or silver, okay? So I know just a review of the basics to start, and now we're going to start to get a little bit more into the meat uh, uh, on the bone here. So... Pro tip number one, I've, kind of, I've got like three or four pro tips worked into this workshop. Pro tip number one, actually, these are very basic rules. If you follow these rules, you will certainly find yourself in a better position to be acquiring or disposing of physical precious metals. Number one, in order to avoid 99% of any possible problems that you can experience when you're buying physical metal, please do one thing always buy from a reputable dealer. This is a dealer that's been in business for a number of years that has a, 
uh, a vast quantity of positive testimonials or uh, reviews online, someone maybe local that you can trust that has a good reputation, always buy from a reputable source. If you do this, you will avoid a lot of potential risks or pitfalls that can, not always will, but can happen when it comes to buying physical precious metals. Number two, when you're purchasing products, when you're selecting the products that you want to purchase, and this will be a common theme throughout today's workshop, I really recommend that you purchase recon recognized, reputable brands, okay? When you go off and you start deal hunting and you start looking uh, for the cheapest products available to you in terms of premium, which we're going to talk about a lot, you can actually end up with products that are illiquid products that other buyers potentially won't want, products that you may not be able to sell in a more global market. So you want to try to stick to reputable and recognized refiners. If you don't know what these are, you can refer to the LBMA good delivery list. You can refer to the COMEX good delivery list. There are a number of reference points that you can refer to, or again, you know, just stick to the Royal Canadian Mint, the US Mint, PAMP Swiss, uh, Sunshine Mint, just to name a few. There are many out there, so it won't be difficult for you to find them. But once you, you veer away from uh, the, the more commonly accepted products, you can run into a situation where you'll have more difficulty selling it, or when, it, when you do sell it, you'll get less money for it. So you want to try to stick to those, those reputable brands, with, you know, which applies to most things in life. And I kind of mentioned it earlier, but in a sense, try to avoid deal hunting, or if you, you know, if you are going to be deal hunting, don't only look at the premium, which is the difference between uh, what you pay for a product and the spot price. The, anything above the spot price, which we talked about earlier, and the total price that you pay for a product is considered premium. Don't only focus on saving premium. Think about the total spread, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to elaborate on what total spread is next. But when you go out there and you're deal hunting and you're looking for the absolute rock bottom deal, you may find it, but you might also realize later that it wasn't necessarily the best precious metal product to purchase. So with total spread in mind, let me explain to you what total spread means. What we've got here, again, going back to the gold and silver spot prices, uh, we, we've got a ticker demonstrating the gold and silver spot price and the ask and bid for both of those metals. Now, those are going to come in to the equation in just a second. What we want to talk about here, what I want you to understand, it's such a fundamentally important uh, component of purchasing precious metals is understanding what the total spread is. When you understand how to calculate the total spread and then look at your potential uh, investment options uh, and future sales with the total spread in mind, this is when you will make the best investment decisions possible when it comes to physical metals, okay? So it's very important that you understand this concept. A lot of people tend to focus almost exclusively on the premium that they're going to pay. So again, that's the uh, difference between the spot price and the total uh, cost of a product. In this case, the premium per ounce being uh, $3. So we've got this, uh, uh, the spot ask silver place price plus a $3 premium. A lot of people focus exclusively on that number and they say to themselves, well, if I get the lowest premium possible, then I must be buying, you know, I must be making a good purchase. And that's not necessarily wrong. It can though be misleading. So let me just continue along this thread here. <clears throat> the other side of that equation is when you always have to think ahead when it comes to investing in precious metals, not only how much money or how much premium did I save up front when I bought it, but what am I going to get for that product that I chose to invest in in the future when it comes time to sell that? So you need to be thinking about what is my cost to sell or what will someone pay me when it comes time to sell? Now, in this example, I've said that if I were to take that, that, that product that I purchased at a $3 premium and I turn around and sold it immediately, maybe I'm gonna get 25 cents under the spot bid price, bringing the amount of money that I would receive back if I were to sell it right away to $22.01. 
The difference between what I paid the $25.39, which is the spot ask price plus premium, $25.39, minus the $22.01, which is the amount of money I would get when I sell that one ounce silver product, equates to the total spread. And the total spread in this case is $3.38. So I'm not only looking at the premium I pay up front, I'm also looking at the discount that I receive when I sell the product, giving me the total spread of 338. Now let me elaborate a little bit more, give you one more example, demonstrating what I'm, I'm trying to get at here, which makes the total spread so important. And then I'm gonna give you some golden rules about maximizing or, or making the best purchases possible with the total spread in mind. So I'm gonna take an example where we have the option of buying a one ounce silver round or a one ounce silver maple leaf. So my cost to purchase a one ounce silver round, in this case is a spot ask 22.39 plus $2.50 premium, giving me a total cost to purchase of 24.89. Okay, great so far, you know, paying $2.50 premium. Pretty good deal in this market. Now, when is my cost to sell or what am I gonna receive when it comes time to sell that one ounce silver round? I would say fair, fair market value right now for one ounce silver round is probably gonna be around spot bid or 25 cents under spot bid, about 1% under spot bid. So if I turn around and sold that one ounce silver round, my, my cash in pocket would be about $22, $22.01 in this case. That gives me a total spread of $2.88 for that one ounce silver round, which isn't bad. Now I'm comparing the two to see which has the total best, uh, the, the best total spread. I've gone out and taken a look at a one ounce silver maple. Now this is only an example and you can apply this simple math to any two products that you wanna compare or more products if you really wanna dive into it. But I've chosen a one ounce silver maple leaf here. Cost to purchase my one ounce silver maple leaf is $3.50 premium over the spot ass price, which is a full dollar more than one ounce silver round. So at first glance, that one ounce silver round looks like the best purchase, but hold on. Let's first look at what it's going to cost me to sell that one ounce silver maple or what I'm, I expect to get back when I sell. My local dealer in this case is bidding a dollar over the spot price, the spot bid price for that one ounce silver maple, bringing uh, you know, the cash back to me up to 23.26. My total spread per ounce is only $2.63. So this example is meant to drive home the idea that don't only look at your premium up front, look at the total spread for uh, competing physical products and select products that have the best or the tightest total spread. That is where you will maximize your purchases, your investments, and you will be able to buy more ounces for your dollar over the long run. So if you're always saving yourself one or 2% on all of your transactions over a lifetime, in, uh, when it comes time uh, to invest in physical metals, you will be able to accumulate more ounces for your dollar, which in the end is the best way to invest in physical metal. Okay. So I, I hope that's helpful. We'll shift gears a little bit now. Sticking to the idea of total spread, I'm going to give you my three golden rules, I call them, when it comes time uh, to making purchases. Now, these are you could say oversimplified, but the concepts are solid, proven. I apply these in my own personal purchases. And there are three things that you should be reminded of when you're going out into the marketplace looking to buy physical metal. Number one, gold has the lowest premium and uh, total spread in terms of percentage points of all five of the physical precious metals. So when we're looking to invest in either gold, silver, platinum, palladium, or rhodium, gold tends to have the lowest premiums and total spreads in terms, in percentage terms. Okay. So if you're going into an investment thinking, I'm only going to be investing in one metal, I want to get as much as I possibly can for my dollar, then typically you will look at gold as the metal that has the uh, tightest total spreads. Number two, second golden rule is bars tend to have lower premiums and total spreads than uh, coins. Now, 
There are exceptions to that rule, and I would advocate that you go out and do the simple math for yourself. There are, there are different market conditions, there are different circumstances that, that where this rule may not always apply, but in general, bars tend to have tighter spreads than coins. And especially, golden rule number three, when you get into the larger format bars. So if you're investing, for example, in 100 ounces of silver, there is a strong tendency that if you were to buy a 100 ounce silver bar versus 100 silver coins or silver rounds, you will pay lower premium and have a tighter total spread with the 100 ounce bar than you would with the coins or rounds. So again, these are general rules. There are exceptions, but they are general rules that you can follow. Uh, again, gold having the tightest total spread of all five precious metals. Bars tend to have a total uh, tighter total spread than coins. And the larger the format bar uh, that you can afford for any investment, generally you'll save a few dollars that way as well. Okay. Now, I wanted to take a minute just to bring silver into the conversation because obviously we're at the silver symposium. Um, silver is, is always a part of the conversation when it comes to precious metals. I tend to use gold uh, as kind of the, uh, the one that sums up all of all precious metals, but obviously there are key differences between gold and silver. Now, if you look at these five-year charts, the reason that I have them in the presentation is to show you that as a general rule, gold and silver tend to follow the same long-term trends, okay? Even though gold and silver have different industrial applications, and silver, in fact, has many, many more, over 100 industrial applications, the overall trend, market trend, or market forces that, that affect gold and silver are the same. A lot of it is investment demand driven. And therefore the overall trend over time tends to be the same. But what is important, the takeaway that I want you to remember here is that silver tends to be much more volatile in an up market. So when we had the, when we were affected by, uh, you know, really the, the, the peak COVID lockdowns back in mid 2020, you know, still affecting us today. I couldn't be there today with you guys because of COVID, unfortunately. But um, when we were really experiencing the peak and there was a really high demand for physical precious metals, we saw both gold and silver spike, but we saw silver really spike even dramatically more than gold. Gold went up about 35% during this period of time. Silver uh, basically doubled. It went from about $12 an ounce uh, up, upwards of almost $30 an ounce. So a very dramatic incline for silver. Silver, as a general rule, is more volatile than gold. And in an upwards market, it will increase more in value, which is why some investors tend to like silver and they like silver, especially for a trade. But that is also true. And I'll just move this for a second. That is also true in a downward market. We saw gold come off its highs uh, somewhere around August of 2020 and silver Again, the trend being more or less the same, but the silver downturn was more dramatic. So silver is more volatile in an upwards market and more volatile in a downwards market. So if you are going to include silver in your precious metals portfolio, and I do recommend that you diversify amongst the metals, then you just need to be aware that silver is going to be the more volatile of these two metals. Now, often, often forgotten in the conversation when it comes to having a well-diversified precious metals portfolio are the platinum group metals. So again, the precious metals consist of gold, silver, platinum, palladium, and rhodium. Platinum, palladium, and rhodium are not, in my experience, often looked at by retail investors. And I, I've always, always advocated that retail investors also consider having a portion of their portfolio in in the platinum group metals. Now, this is a, a, a recap of the performance of gold versus platinum and palladium since 2015. What you'll notice is that between 2015 and 2017, 2018, these metals were really kind of performing 
you know, within the same bandwidth. There, again, there was that overall trend that they were performing at the same rate. And that's common for physical precious metals during a, a kind of sideways market, which, you know, they found themselves in for nearly a decade after the last financial crisis that ended in about 2011, 2012. But what we noticed since then, and, and what is important to take away here is that palladium, uh, the gray line here, really took off in 2018, 2019, 20, and 21. It had massive returns for, its, for investors. And so I beg of you to do a little bit more research into platinum group metals, especially palladium is very attractive. It's used primarily in catalytic converters, almost, almost exclusively in catalytic converters in the, in the auto manufacturing industry. And having a precious metal other than gold or silver can really be rewarding in your portfolio. I'm not saying necessarily go, you know, 33%, 33%, 33% in gold, silver, palladium, but I am recommending that you have some exposure to the platinum group metals because these metals do act differently, one from the other, and they do have different industrial applications. In the case of platinum and palladium, because of the auto manufacturing industry, you can have a, a completely different performance in the market. So give some thought to uh, the platinum group metals. That's another uh, tip that I can give you. Pro tip number three, this is one that is probably most often uh, forgotten uh, by precious metal investors. We are all guilty of being very loyal to our gold and silver and hopefully some platinum in the future. Um, we tend, and what, something I've seen with, with clients that I've worked with over the years is they tend not to have a clear exit strategy for their investments, okay? They they buy gold and silver and they sleep so well at night knowing that they own it that they don't want to sell it or, or they never sell it. Or uh, in another case, they are waiting for much, much higher numbers. For example, you know, you hear a lot of people talk about $100 silver, $200 silver. I've seen people talk about $500 silver. And I'm not saying that that will never happen, but being married to fixed price targets that are so far away from where we find ourselves today can actually be a little bit of a curse because there are many opportunities along the way to take a profit and then turn that profit around and buy other undervalued asset classes, wait for those to rise, sell those off, and then go buy back and buy physical precious metals again. So one thing that I would like people to consider today is Yes, uh, we all love precious metals. Yes, it is important to always have precious metals in your portfolio, but half a portion of your precious metals available to, to, to trade, or in other words, don't be afraid of taking a profit uh, when your precious metals have performed well. For example, if you bought silver at $12 an ounce or your average cost price was somewhere about $12 an ounce, and last year it ran up to about 28 $29 an ounce, there's really no good reason that you shouldn't be taking a profit when you've, you know, you've doubled an investment, you've earned 100% return on your investment. You should be selling some of your silver in a case like that, T taking those profits, paying off some debt, you know, throwing those back into undervalued assets because there's always other opportunities on the market to invest in, not only precious metals, you should be diversified. And then, you know, you can always step back into the precious metals market once we've come off the highs like we have now, you know, silver dropping back down to the range of $22, $23 an ounce. That's a good opportunity to come back into the market, you know, and, and you, you've taken profit and come back in and bought at a lower price point. So always be open to taking some profits. Um, yeah, and basically, you know, this is what I was trying to say again. Um, if, if you are willing to take profits at, at, at the peak of a market or, or when you've done very well on an investment and then looking for that market to cool off, like we, we've seen right now, not only is the spot price down to $22 or $23 an ounce, but premiums on products are slowly starting to come down as well. We're seeing the, the total spreads on products starting to tighten up again because dealers are competing 
on price, you know, demand is down a little bit. So dealers are trying to compete on their premium. So there's an opportunity again for you to come in and make a very sensible buy at these lower prices. And that would be a message that I would leave with you today. I think that, you know, we're, we're maybe all a little bit disappointed that the bull run that we experienced in 2020 um, wasn't as long as we had hoped for. It was pretty dramatic. You know, silver doubled, gold up 35%. That's a great run, but it wasn't a very long bull run. So some people are there sitting there going, man, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed that precious metals isn't performing at the level that I expect it would. And I would say to those people, number one, it is normal for metals to consolidate after a very strong bull run. Um, and I would say the table is still set for, for further uh, price appreciation for precious metals. But more importantly today, if, if you're looking at your precious metals portfolio, and I personally, I'm thinking this is a great buy opportunity. This is a time where I wanna reload, you know, that we've come off uh, those highs significantly, uh, we're talking about a, a 30%, 40% drop in silver from that high. Uh, I'd like to reload now and, and start accumulating again, working my way towards the next high. So that's, that's where my headspace is at right now. We have a little bit more time. Uh, so I just wanted to leave you with one more nugget before I wrap up today's workshop. Uh, it's a little bit of a bonus tip. This is something that comes up up very often a question uh, that, that investors often ask about. And we've done a video on YouTube uh, that that's really goes in depth on this subject is traveling with gold and silver. W is that possible? Can I travel internationally? What can I expect at the airport? Uh, is it legal? You know, a lot of people, first of all, think they can't even travel with precious metals. They think it's, it's illegal because there's a, there's a line on the declaration card that asks you to declare it when you travel. So I just wanted to take a few minutes and kind of go through this one. It's a, it's a pretty fun subject and it's something you might find yourself doing one day. So first of all, mo most important thing that you need to know is, is traveling with precious metals internationally, not domestically, but internationally is completely legal. Um, precious metals under the law is considered personal property. So it's equivalent of you traveling with a watch it's, can, it's equivalent of you traveling with uh, jewelry that you might own. It is your property. So um, you, you, you can rest assured that legally speaking, you are allowed to bring your personal property with you wherever you might be headed. Now, there are some exceptions, second and third world countries that you may want to avoid uh, because of uh, risk of, um, of theft or corruption at the border. But generally, if you're traveling to first world countries, developed countries, you're not gonna have any problems at all. And this is not only for amounts of $10,000 or less, this is also for amounts upward of $10,000. The difference being, you can always travel with large amounts of precious metals, but you need to declare them. And when you declare something, it doesn't make it illegal. It's just a, a requirement of that government, of the country that you're visiting, that you declare those assets. So anytime, I really, you know, I, I can't emphasize this enough. Anytime you are carrying more than the limit of the country that you're heading into, in the, the case of the US, it's $10,000. Some other countries, it's $15,000. Always declare the metal, okay? And then this, the question becomes, do I declare the face value of the coins, those gold eagles, those $50 gold eagle pieces that I'm carrying? Or, or do I declare the market value? And from my experience, someone who's traveled with precious metals many times in my career, um, I would highly recommend that you use the market value of the metal content as the declaration amount. Because the last thing that you want is to get in an argument, a theoretical dispute with the customs agent who is processing you into the country and you know them getting upset and, and, and them having a different point of view. So just go with the higher amount go with the declared market value. Again, it is completely legal to do this and they're not gonna confiscate this metal from you. It's your personal property. They have no right to it. And, you know, common sense here, guys, just be prepared. You know, here's how it works. When you're leaving the United States, you do not have to, uh, when you're going through the airport, think of the process. You are not at any point in time declaring to a customs agent what you are carrying on you. The only people that are going to be aware of what you have in your uh, carry-on luggage, because that's where you should have your precious metals, do not put it in your check bag, put it in your carry-on. 
The only people that are aware of what you're going to have in that carry-on is airport security. The people that work at the uh, radar or, or scanning station, the ones that, you know, where you have to take off your shoes and your belt and you put everything on the conveyor belt. Those are the people that are going to see it. What's going to happen is when your bag goes down the conveyor belt and it is scanned, precious metals comes up as a black hole. It is a dense material, whether it be gold, silver, platinum, palladium, rhodium, it's all very dense. So it comes up as a black hole on the scanning at the scanning station. That's going to flag the person to want to take another look. So if you're putting any substantial amount of precious metals on that conveyor belt, prepare yourself to be brought to a secondary station. When you get to secondary station, either they're going to ask you what's in your bag. More generally, they're going to open your bag and take a peek inside. Don't panic. Don't feel like you've done anything wrong. You have not. Again, it's personal property. It's completely legal. You're allowed to do it. They just need to take a second look. Now, you can kind of whisper to them that, yes, you have some precious metals. And if you're really not comfortable with that person opening your bag in, in the public and then maybe, you know, your fellow passengers seeing what's in your bag, ask them to take you to, the sec to, to a separate room. Again, it doesn't mean you're in trouble. You're not going to get arrested. They're not going to confiscate your metal. I've done it many times in my, my career, both, you know, for personal reasons and professional reasons. They're going to take you in that secondary room. They're going to open your bag. Usually they're actually quite professional and, you know, they're going to look through your stuff. They're going to put it back and they're going to send you on your way. So just be prepared, be calm, cool, and collected when you go through airport security. Well, everyone, that concludes today's workshop. I hope that you found it beneficial. If you did, please feel free to check out our other videos on YouTube. We have a great series called Inside the Vault. It has 16 episodes dedicated to gold and silver. Otherwise, you can learn more about SWP at swpcayman.com. You can always email us for more information or follow us on Twitter at SWP Gold, or you can follow me directly at Yaxley Yax. Thank you very much. Have a great day.